It's David here. Uh, this is our Friday morning session, Europe time. We are uh, small and very beautiful, and uh, that is how it should be. We would like this time once again to focus on COVID world, COVID world uh, coming up with in uh, just right now, we're in the middle of, of Thanksgiving and uh, wanted to talk a bit about what, what Thanksgiving can be like and should be like and what is actually happening in different parts of the world. So brief Thanksgiving reflection, a brief uh, anticipating Christmas reflection. Uh, and then I want to also hear about what's happening locally and uh, Miles Breeden, I'm very pleased to see you here. And uh, I, I wanted to talk with you a bit about the Kenya situation. Delighted to introduce Lena Nierlander, who is working at the uh, European Centers for Disease Control. And if Lena wants at some point during our one hour briefing, I'd like her to give a few minutes on some of the work that she's been doing looking at contact tracing around the place, uh, particularly in Europe, and then also looking at COVID apps and generally what it's like trying to get a measure of what's happening in different places uh, to compare. And so that I would like that to be, if we can make it a bit of a chunk. Uh, and then I want to ask John Atkinson to talk a bit about the uh, approaches that are being adopted in some UK local authorities. Uh, we've been able to get some quite interesting information about what John calls the wraparound characteristics of integrated local responses, what we've been talking about in these briefings for some months, but actually seeing it in practice. So, I mean, that's quite a, quite a, uh, um, an exciting for me menu of people who've got things to say and as more people join uh, I will be inviting them to give little snippets as I say of Covid world and um, um, as we as we just go in I thought I would also make one other comment which is that uh, with colleagues in the WHO I have been focusing on uh, messaging over the coming few weeks in Europe and North America, just to always make sure that we're on in sync. And also the, the challenging messaging about what arrival of a vaccine means. And I just want to confirm that what I've said in previous briefings is still very much standing and that is that we are not going to be able to expect that with the arrival of the vaccine, bam, coming along, in some places, small number of doses in December, other places in January and February. Uh, but it doesn't mean that all the existing work that we're doing to try to restrict transmission just stops and everybody shifts over onto a vaccine-based prevention. No, it won't be like that. It's going to need to be bringing the vaccine alongside the other interventions in the Do It All series. And uh, that's going to be a communications challenge big, big time, uh, which uh, our WHO friends are fully immersed in. And any ideas about holding that quite delicate message that we are going to have to continue doing physical distancing, mask wearing, uh, in enhanced hygiene, isolation when sick and looking after people in older or more vulnerable uh, age groups and settings that keeping that, that stuff going whilst the vaccine is gradually uh, rolled out or vaccines are gradually rolled out is going to be the vital message for the first half of 2021 uh, and longer because remember this vaccine rollout is a slow process so all that thinking through the messaging for COVID world will be the undercurrent of today's briefing. Uh, okay, welcome just to everybody and Twee. Uh, hello, Chris Langdon, lovely to see you. I just noticed you're here. And Georgina, hello, lovely to see you as well. Thank you for joining. Jane Badham from South Africa. Holly Wheeler, always great that you're here. Sarah, lovely to see you. Marianne, thank you for joining. 
excellent. Uh, William, thank you for being here. Iman, lovely. So we've got quite a, quite a group here. Aileen Kennedy, thank you very much for joining as well. Lovely. Uh, and Haruko in Tokyo, excellent. Annie Felton in Colchester, lovely to see you all. And Chris Shipton uh, on, um, on the paint board, lovely to see you as well. Here we go, Twee. Thank you and hello everyone. Uh, you'll see on your screen just now the pop-up of the poll. Uh, this is just so we get to know who's with us today uh, and uh, in the mood of the room. So the first question there, share where you're joining from. Uh, once you've ticked that, scroll down, select your age range and then scroll down again and select how you're feeling today. You can select uh, multiple answers for that third question there. I'll keep this open uh, in case you don't want to answer right now and then we can come back to the results later. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, first of all, let's go to Catherine. Catherine, uh, it, it's Thanksgiving and uh, your actual Thanksgiving day was yesterday and you and your family are trying to work out how to celebrate Thanksgiving. It means an awful lot to you, like it does to all people from your country. How are you managing? Uh, thanks, David. Um, it was Thanksgiving yesterday, so happy belated Thanksgiving to everybody. Um, and uh, just, just so you know, it's my favorite holiday of the whole year. No commercialism, just eating a meal and being thankful with your family. Um, and usually we have an enormous extended family visit us um, and also everybody in our neighborhood and all of my friends. We often have 30 and 35 people over for Thanksgiving. Obviously, this year things are quite different. But my family in Geneva has been isolating since March with another family down the street who have kids the same age as mine. And so we, the eight of us, are going to have Thanksgiving together on Saturday, which we're really looking forward to. Um, and it's gonna be smaller and different, but I think just as nice. And we just found a turkey. So that is the most exciting news since it's really hard to do in Geneva. It is not the easiest, easiest task. Um, so I'm, I'm really grateful to have this community and be part of this and thanks for letting me talk about my Thanksgiving. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, I mean, I think uh, Catherine and I were preparing for an interview that we, we did with a guy called Richard Quest on CNN last night. Uh, and uh, I was thinking about Catherine's Thanksgiving style when Richard Quest was asking his questions and of course, uh, for, to make it interesting, he had to spice it up. And he said, how are you going to make sense of this? You've got the current president telling people just to move around and do what they want and travel and go everywhere. And the president elect saying, be really careful. They have a very limited Thanksgiving, restrict the number of people that you see uh, because we've got this virus expanding across the country at increasing speed. And uh, uh, when you sort of, you then, then he turns to, to me and he says, are you in WHO worried about what is being said by the two different uh, leaders in the United States? It's a bit sort of difficult to answer, but of course it's worrying. I mean, we've seen on numerous occasions that if you, have a, a big movement of people like happened in Europe when students went back to university or happened in South Dakota at a motorbike rally or has happened in numerous uh, spreader events like the one in uh, India that was at the beginning of the, of the Indian COVID. Um, you know, these are very potent at centrifuging the virus out into communities and in preparing for the uh, CNN, I, I checked the, at the spatial spread of COVID in the US, state by state, and it's in, I think, 48 of 50 states or 49 of 50 states. And it is really very, uh, very uh, intense. So this very widespread distribution of the virus in the US and the multiple people, I can't remember Catherine, but I think it was 50 million people 50 moving, million people moving 50 million people moving, million moving around. This is kind of, in a public health terms, it's a, a sort of toxic mix. So let's move towards uh, 
um, sort of uh, other issues and uh, particularly COVID world. And I just wanted to, um, first of all, check uh, who, who would like to say a quick word or two. I am uh, just checking with people uh, that I know and, and looking around and trying to see uh, whether they, they, um, they would like to, to, um, to speak. And uh, perhaps I go to Miles Breeding. Miles, you were been talking to us a bit about what's happening uh, in Kenya. It'd be lovely to hear from you. Uh, I'm just checking to see whether we've got any other, anybody else uh, besides uh, people in your family uh, on. Don't seem to have our, our usual Kenya participants. So, Miles, could you tell us how things look from where you are? And then after you, I'd like to go to Lena. Miles. Uh, morning, everybody. Um, thank you, David. Um, uh, the yeah, the, the um, percentage of uh, people uh, who are coming out positive from the test is, is not looking good, but, but still the numbers are quite low. And I, th I had this week um, the very interesting point that um, people, uh, yeah, general people in Kenya are, are not trusting the government because the government warned uh, that there was gonna be a terrible problem with, with COVID and um, did a very strict lockdown and, and now, there isn't as bad a problem as they had, as as the government had said there was being, which means that there's an issue with trust, um, uh, which I, I just think is really fascinating and is going to be a real problem with with government messaging, and it, it it means people like you, I'm afraid, David, are going to have to come to the fore because people trust, you. Know, doctors and experts um, uh, much more than they trust governments. And I think that's, a, that's not a problem just in Kenya, that's a, that's a problem all over the world, just a fundamental lack of trust in governments. But it's just a really interesting twist here that yeah, they, they don't trust the government because, um, uh, because it's not as bad as they had said it was going to be, which um, is fascinating, I think. Well, thanks very much indeed. You see, this is, why working in communicable diseases is always challenging. So you, the government says the problem's going to be bad. So could people restrict their movements? People restrict their movements, and possibly do other things like mask wearing, and the instance drops. You, you bend the curve and you end up with low numbers. And then people turn around and say, hey, it wasn't so bad, was it? Why did we go to all that trouble? And trying to explain that kind of cause and effect uh, relationship and help people understand it is very difficult. Um, um, and and it's, a, it's a really difficult situation here as well, Miles, in that in France, there's a, quite a lot of uh, public frustration uh, that they've gone through all the restrictions and the numbers have come down. And um, then there are still restrictions, even though the numbers are down because they don't want the numbers to go up again. Uh, so trying to manage the, the communication around what has to be done when your numbers are dropping, I think is super complex. It sounds like Miles, and I've heard it from other sources as well, it's proving to be a real challenging thing for Kenyan authorities. I hope that you and family are well. We can see others are on. And uh, if you want to come back on that or anything else, please let us know. Thanks for making the point that uh, when government is not trusted, they, it, it requires choosing spokespeople very, very carefully, which I think is a really tricky issue too. Anything else from you, Miles? Okay. Let me go to Lena Nierlander. Lena, uh, who I've known for some time, uh, I mean, long, long time, uh, as a really skillful epidemiologist. She's working at the European Centers for Disease Control. Lena, I, I've been really advocating in these briefings uh, right now for many months, the build up of community-wide capacity to be able to de detect people with COVID 
and to be able to isolate them and to trace their contacts and to isolate the contacts. Uh, and I've see, seen that as the absolute backbone of community level defenses. You've been looking at contact tracing experiences around Europe. And, you know, I'm gonna ask you the question that I'm often asked by others. Uh, has Europe really sort of failed on contact tracing as part of the uh, defense strategy? And is it inevitable that we're going to go on just simply seesawing in Europe between uh, freedom and lockdown, freedom and lockdown, or is there some hope for the contact tracing services to come back to a standard that's sufficient? Hi, thank you, David. Uh, that's a rather more complicated question that I was prepared to answer <laughs> this morning, actually. <laughs> um, I mean, we've been looking at contact tracing since the beginning, I've uh, been working on it since about February, March, and trying to provide kind of the latest evidence to countries and kind of base our guidance on the latest evidence about what we know about transmission, how long people are infectious for, when they start being infectious um, and so on. And I mean, contact tracing has never been the only way to address the epidemic is always, our recommendation has always been to do this together with other measures. It's not, uh, you know, you can't control, well, unless you have very, very few cases, it's unlikely you could control the epidemic just with contact tracing, but it can help you get, you know, if your goal is to get R naught below one, then this, it can go some way to do this. And then you have to have other measures uh, in parallel to that. But what's important is also the, um, I mean, people always think about the contact tracing, like you have to trace all the contacts and quarantine them, which is true, but it's also about what happens before, like how, if you have a symptomatic case, the key is to get that symptomatic case diagnosed as soon as possible and the contacts traced as soon as possible after that. Because if you have a case and the contact, they have a dinner with a contact you know, two days before they become symptomatic, then they become symptomatic. Then they sit around for a couple of days at home waiting to see if they get, need to get tested maybe. And then they call for a test and then there's a waiting for the test. And then several days might have passed before the contact is eventually traced and they might already have transmitted to other people. So one thing that we're trying to push is just, you know, test widely, test quickly, let people know that they need to get tested as soon as they have symptoms um, and then turn around the test and trace the contacts quickly. Um, now, and so contact tracing is just one of a range of measures uh, that we have. And I think you know, a lot of countries have been challenged with capacity for sure. And, but it's, it's better to keep going and try to trace some contacts than to give up because uh, you're still making uh, a contribution. So, but yeah, no, I recognize for sure it's challenging. And then we've also been working on the mobile apps, uh, the digital contact tracing. And that's as a new and as yet unproven technology. And we're trying to figure out how we can, we're trying to put together a framework for countries to evaluate if the apps are making a difference. Um, but that has, but it's also, it shouldn't really be a standalone measure. It should be integrated into the regular contact tracing um, services because it's not, we still need to link up people with public health for advice and we can't just leave them alone with the app basically. Part so it's a range of measures, yeah. Part of a system. Mm -hmm. I'm really interested in your point that the interval between somebody having symptoms and then actually being tested and then the contact tracing happening needs to be short. If it's mm. lots of days, then all sorts of, uh, problems can happen, test quickly, get the results quickly, trace the mm. contacts quickly. That seems to have got challenging in, uh, in many European countries. Do you feel that they are managing to shorten that interval over time or is that proving hard, a hard nut to crack? We don't really collect data to that level from countries. Um, so we, we have indicators that we recommend countries look at to monitor their yeah. own efforts, but at the European level, we don't collect right. that data comprehensively. So I can't really answer that question. I think there's a lot of variations over time and between yeah. regions and different countries. So, yeah. Mm. Well, yeah. well, just your point that contact tracing should be part of a system, Lena, is something that uh, John Atkinson, who's been looking at systems and particularly local systems, uh, has been uh, bringing into his thinking. So while Lean, building on what Lena said, uh, 
John, could you just give us what you're seeing about the different pieces of the system coming together uh, in your uh, examination of some of the settings in, in the UK? Over to you, John. Thank you, David. It's, it's good to build on what Lena was saying. So this is this is a sort of feedback from conversations with one particular English city uh, who've got a good history of um, getting organised as a city across all the various agencies that work there. And their phrase has always been, it works here because everyone makes it their business to make it work. So in terms of contact tracing, what they get each day is, 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 is a, a bulk list of names from the national tracing system of people who haven't been found quickly by, by the, the call handlers on, on the national system. And they prioritize that those people uh, to look particularly first at the people in the top 10 most deprived areas of the city. Um, and if they don't find people in 24 hours, they move on because there's another list to pull down and they just become swamped with, with, the, with, the, with the hardest cases if, if they don't. Um, the thing about their call handlers in, in, in the city is that they can access and triage people uh, to all sorts of other services that are available. Some of those are provided by you know, agencies like the local council, many of them provided by voluntary agencies. So things like how do you get to the food banks if you need, if you need to be fed? How do we get food to you? How do you get uh, debt counselling? How do you deal with bereavement? A lot of those coming from, from, from what we would call the third sector and, and the call handlers at this level are able to connect people with that. And that increases the likelihood that they, they're going to isolate. And if they've got um, a, a physical address, uh, it's very often volunteers, um, you know, vo voluntary organisations, third sector, who go and find them. In terms of testing, they had a um, uh, initially two large national test centres placed in, in, in the city. They were, they were in quite central locations. But like many English cities, in the, in the sort of reconstruction post-World post War II and clearing of, of, of Victorian housing, a lot of the, the poorer housing is now spread quite wide in the city. It's not near the centre and people don't come into the centre from those, those places. So they've now set up testing uh, centres again in, in, in the most deprived areas. So people who, who don't have cars and, and can't access transport get there. They put them in the universities as well, big university city. They run pop-up testing centres. Um, they keep them going about four weeks. They've found all sorts of innovative, innovative ways of um, getting people to them. The most effective, they said, was when the Muezzin at the mosque was, was calling people to prayer. Uh, he was also saying, and visit the pop-up testing centre that's at the mosque. Uh, the school Facebook chat um, has been a good way to do it. But they're still finding that, particularly in, in, in the sort of harder hit areas, it makes a big difference to your income if you're tested positive and can't work. As a lot of people, for example, say working as taxi drivers who, who, who can't work, so they don't get a test. John, we, yep. John, at that point, I'm just going to be paying. Uh, when I read your, your, your notes on this, it really struck me, and I'm hearing it from so many other people, that, that you don't like uh, being found to be positive. Uh, because it, it interferes with your income and it interferes with your social position. So you do everything possible not to be named as a contact and indeed not to be found positive. Is that right, John? That's, that's absolutely what's happening. And what we're hearing anecdotally, um, not just in this city, but in other cities where I've spoken, is people just turning the app off. It's great to have an app that, that sort of works, but you turn it off because what you don't want to do is one, lose income or two, be seen as responsible for causing your, your friends or family to lose income. So people just make themselves untraceable. And that's why, um, you know, when Lena said, you know, tracing is just one part of the system, we have to make it okay for people to isolate. They're reporting that they don't know how many people isolate properly. They think it's as low as 18 to 20% in, in the city. And therefore, if there was one big lesson to take out of it, David, the thing that they've got that's working really well is this wraparound of volunteers, um, agencies, all trying to make it easy for people to integrate. But if, you, if they're saying, if you see test and trace as simply the answer, it's not enough, it's not the point. The point is to get people to change the behavior that, that breaks the chains of transmission. And at the moment, uh, you know, where there are gaps between the way the national systems work, the local systems work, and people's mess the messages people hear, 
that results in behavior that doesn't actually break the chains, even if you get large numbers of tests run and the numbers look good. So you're describing an integrated system and uh, you've been looking at the different actions that are being taken in the UK. What are the constraints to going more widespread in the UK beyond the cities that you've been looking at with an integrated system? And just while I'm talking, Krishna Ramamurthy said, which city are you talking about? When you and I discussed it, we said that you would anonymize it because you've been able to talk to people and it's in, we actually have not got permission to talk about the specific location. So I think uh, we should probably stay that way unless, unless you want to change it. No, I think we'll, we'll keep it as it is. I think um, the difference between places is probably about the level of relationship that already exists in that city, but the, the messages are probably still the same wherever it might be. And the, the, the constraints really are about the relationships between the different levels of response. Uh, in terms of a national response, we've built something really, really quickly and very huge, but we've got big contractors who are simply for, you know, who are fulfilling the contract that they've been asked to do. But that doesn't involve, for example, at a national testing centre in a city, allowing the council, allowing the voluntary services to, to have their people on site and be able to start to talk to people in order that um, they, they, can, they can encourage people who, who might be anxious about isolation to do the right thing. So it's those sorts of joins that are more important. It's interesting the city wasn't saying throw more money at us, throw more people at us, throw more tests at us. They didn't want large scale lateral flow testing. They think it would cause as, as many problems as it would solve. What they wanted was the connections to work better. So connections, we'll come back to that again. Lena's got to go off and do something else. Lena, uh, just uh, thank you very much for joining us. Any reflection on what you heard from John? Um, I thought it was very interesting to hear about this issue of, of the worry about income and what it means to be declared a case or a contact. And I think that's a major issue. Um, some countries are giving income support, others are giving, um, I think UK is giving income support to people, but that might not, if you run your own business, that might not really mean very much. And then there is kind of food and other essentials. And also this worry about what if you say, oh, I was with so-and-so and they now had to quarantine. What does that mean? Um, and I think that's a really tricky thing to get around. So this sort of trust and sense of community and cooperation is really important, but it's definitely tricky. And I'm, I was glad to hear those experiences. Well, that's what, in a way, we've been focusing on. Thank you, Lena, for being with us and welcome. And we meet twice a week. And if you or any of your colleagues ever feel like joining, the one thing we try not to do is to make anybody feel uncomfortable, but we do like people to stretch a bit and uh, <laughs> you, you were very, very kind to do that. Okay, Lena, thank you. Um, yes. Thank you, John. What I'm going to do now, just to tell you, is that um, we've got some questions in the chat about vaccines, uh, plans for vaccinating different groups and also some quite widely reported uh, experiences with one of the vaccine candidates uh, and we'll, we'll answer those. But I want to go to one of our superstars from previous briefings, to Zara Breeden. Zara, good morning to you, and uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, she's, uh, Zara, would you like to ask your question? But you also might like to, um, to comment, to give your own reflections on what's going on, because it's some time now, some weeks since you hosted your own briefing, and uh, it'd be nice to hear what's been going on in your personal, uh, sorry, in your professional existence. I, that's a silly expression, but you know what I mean. I'm not trying to get into personal details, but what's been happening since then? Off you go. Um, so my school kind of opened, but it only opened like a few grades. Um, I think it opened grade 12, grade eight. Uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. Um, but I'm not back at school yet. I'm still doing online school, um, which is really annoying because I really want to see my school and see what it's like. Um, but my question was, why are schools opening everywhere when the virus is getting worse? I, I, I mean, I'm personally not able to give you an answer, but I'm going to tell you a couple of things that I was told quite early on in the pandemic 
and perhaps that will help to at least understand the thinking. When I was talking with people in one European government in March and April, uh, they said to me, the thing that matters the most to us is keeping schools open. They said, we don't mind slowing down uh, other parts of the economy. We don't mind even asking particular sectors like restaurants and uh, hospitality to stop. But keeping schools open really matters for three reasons. One, we don't think that children are as important in spreading the disease as adults. Two, we think it's really important that children don't lose their opportunity to socialize and be educated. Exactly your point, Zara. And, and three, um, they were also saying that if schools are closed, then that can be make life very difficult if both parents are working because that may, may require one parent to stay at home. Another European country during their first lockdown actually kept schools partially open so that they could provide support facilities for, for example, for healthcare workers so they could work. It was very definitely a pro-school policy, but as more and more of the world went into movement restrictions, so school closures became widespread. And there are some parts of the world where schools have been closed for six, seven, eight months. Uh, and you've had a very long closure session yourself, Zara. But there's, you know, the pressures to open schools have increased because of concerns about children losing education. The uh, also, uh, unfortunately, it's also been suggested that older children, like in your age group, are quite easily able to spread the virus. So there's been pressure to open schools, but at the same time, there's been recommendations that over 12 years of age, you need to really physical distance and wear a mask. And so you've had the two forces coming, open the schools because otherwise it's not good for the kids and not good for the families, but be super careful because children are able to get the virus and spread it. But I think on balance in many political settings, the mood is swinging towards uh, finding a way to open schools, but try to do it safely as a way of moving forward, because that is the reality of COVID world. We're going to have this virus around for quite a lot more months and nobody wants schools to say shut. So it's open schools, but open schools safely is the policy that I'm seeing. Now, it's not easy to do. And uh, I talk a lot to school teachers. They say to me, in many of our schools, it's just impossible to enable our students to, main, to maintain physical distancing. It's just impossible to help them stay inside bubbles. And so there's a, it's, a, it's not an uncomfortable area and uh, school teachers are finding it very tough. If anybody would like to comment on Zara's question, which I have not, I don't think, answered very well, uh, because I pointed out there's a dilemma, please do so. Catherine, do you want to comment? Because you did the work for 4SD looking at schools. So I'm going to invite you to speak, Catherine. Sure. So I was just, as David was answering it, I was just reading the latest uh, information, and it is exactly what David said. They haven't updated it. But the other day in one of the press uh, conferences, Maria and Maria Venkakovan and, and Mike Ryan of WHO said that, uh, you know, for some communities, keeping the schools open is also because kids are safe at school. Um, they, uh, you know, if the school is putting in all the prevention measures, then there's an opportunity for kids to both go to school and have eight hours of safety from being exposed to COVID. And so there's a real balance, uh, a balancing act to be taken here. And the, the guidance really is about doing risk assessments. So Zara, I think it's a great question. And the way that WHO frames it is, instead, instead of thinking about the virus getting worse everywhere, it's really about which environment the school is in. So if the environment of the school is in is particularly, has a lot of community transmission, then that's how you balance that risk. If it doesn't, then maybe opening the school is better for lots of reasons. Kids, uh, kids get a lot from school besides just math and reading. 
So, Zara, in many of these decisions, what happens is that you have to balance two sides. And this one, the balance is about whether you keep the school open or you ask kids to stay at home. And then when you're doing that balancing act, you're saying, which is the, which option gives you the greater risk of disease and which option gives the greatest harm to the well-being of children. And of course, having people uh, stay at home was thought to give lower risk of disease, uh, but at the same time, it was seen to be a disadvantage for children. And then you hear from Catherine, this very interesting uh, finding that for some children in some places where there's a lot of virus, actually being at school is safer or lower risk than staying at home. And uh, our friends at the WHO tell us that when working out which way you're going on the balance, that one of the things that you have to bear in mind is the level of transmission of the virus in the community. Uh, I don't know what's happening in your community, but if people, uh, if authorities feel that there's a lot of virus in the community, they may conclude that school is a safer place to be than staying at home. Now, Zara, does it be interested to know, does our efforts to try to uh, at least offer you some of the um, things that people are taking into account when they make decisions, is that helpful to you or just totally confusing? No, it is really helpful. Please be honest. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> now, let's move on to, I lost my microphone. There it is. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Catherine is sharing. I'd like now to, um, I'd like to come to a question about vaccines. Um, Chris Langdon, uh, who says he doesn't want to speak, but I'm always tempted to ask him whether he wants to speak. So uh, um, I'll ask you, Chris, would you like to speak before I talk a bit? Because it's, you, I haven't seen you for a bit. And you've always got interesting observations in our discussions. So it is your moment to riff if you want to. Okay, well, thanks for the offer to riff, David. Good morning. And um, just really a question today. We all thought the good, there was good news from AstraZeneca. Then certainly I'm a communication specialist. We can see it, communications did not go well. I hear both in terms of the public issue, also some issues with their volunteers, which um, I don't want to talk about. But mm. clearly there are some communications issues. But I've heard a number of epidemiologists and vaccine specialists on the radio, but what is your take, given the fact that they have these two results of 60%, 90% this issue of a, they discovered by accident, a lower dose might be more effective. In a way, we, we know everything has been done at really fast speed and penicillin came out of an accident, um, a fortuitous one in that case. No. What is your sense, and the regulator is clearly constantly involved, this dynamic process that's been going on this year, so what is your sense of what that does in terms of the vaccine process and maybe also the public understanding the whole vaccine hesitation issue? Thanks very much indeed. One of the strangest things about the vaccine work that's been going on all over the world is that it's been done with quite a lot of publicity even when the work is underway. And I keep asking myself, what's, what's the reasoning behind this description of progress by press release? Is it just simply uh, companies trying to um, perhaps influence the decision by investors whether or not to invest in them? Because normally, Chris, you don't have a company doing a press release about their uh, vaccine studies, that's all done quietly, confidentially, privately. Codes are not broken before those studies are complete. A dossier 
of data is then prepared for the regulators, because in each country you have regulators, and then the regulators in a super private and very well monitored and recorded way discuss what the results and then in a formal style say number one whether or not the vaccine works and that's always more complicated than a yes no answer it's about efficacy in different age groups efficacy over time efficacy linked to dose and then part two which is almost more important they say what are the adverse side effects that are being reported but of course what really happens is everybody who receives the vaccine in the trials has to keep a record of how they're feeling and whether they've got any sickness and that too is done with great care and then the regulators make a judgment as to whether or not the efficacy of the vaccine is high and the side effects are low and that can lead to this emergency use authorization which is not a full tick but it's basically saying you can administer the vaccine but keep a very close record of all the people who've received the vaccine to just check off how many of them have side effects and of course how many of them end up with the disease even though they were vaccinated so all that is super super well set out it has to be because of you know we're talking here about lives and livelihoods and we're also very keen not to further make people anxious about the process so this releasing of data early which has become a bit of a habit we've had four early releases of data sputnik from russia uh, the Moderna uh, uh, bio and tech vaccine, uh, sorry, the Moderna vaccine, Moderna vaccine, the Pfizer with bio and tech vaccine, and the AstraZeneca Oxford vaccines. So that's four candidates. And in each of them, there's been press releases from the manufacturer. And, uh, you know, purists like me say, what are, what's going on? Catherine's Catherine's agreeing with me. Just in case you wonder, I've got Catherine at my left eye and she's giving me the necessary uh, body uh, reassurance, body language reassurance. So something actually went wrong in the Oxford AstraZeneca trialing, Chris, because they had uh, tests going on in multiple sites and in one of the sites, it seems as though uh, the dose was different from what it was in other sites. There are two doses given, and it seems that in, in one of the sites, the first dose was half what uh, it was elsewhere, which is weird. You know, you don't, don't normally make mistakes like that. Uh, but what happens is when you're doing these studies, you create a very carefully, uh, a very carefully prescribed population sample that you're going to immunize. And also you randomize between those who receive the vaccine and those who receive a placebo. So if there's a different dosing for some of your, uh, some of the people that you're studying, then that um, really, messes things up and the group of people who received the low dose just all happened to be under 55 years of age which meant that that wasn't really a, a complete uh, sample of the whole population but then after they did their initial press release which came out saying 75 percent efficacy they then uh, went on and issued a further uh, clarifying statement saying that in the group that received the half dose, the efficacy was 95%. I personally think that that was an effort to try to show that the results of that vaccine were super good, uh, com comparable with Moderna and uh, Pfizer vaccines. But then uh, academics started saying, oh, oh, hang on, hang on, hang on. 
He said, you can't start making statements about efficacy from this subgroup that received the half dose and saying that that's giving you 95%, because these were people under 55 years and this was a, not the same sample. So in the effort to try to get the number work up in terms of efficacy alongside the other ones, which was uh, strange, um, they seem to have just made one of the most elementary, um, what I would say is, um, I'm not gonna say, I'm, the word I'm trying to find. Um, yeah, okay, they did something that we don't normally do, which is to present the results from a subgroup of the sample as though that was giving us the total efficacy level. And just a really uh, not clever thing to do in my view. So number one, uh, they are actually going to subject their data to peer review and publish something in the Lancet. Uh, this is going to make a big mess because they're going to have to go into more and more detail again before they've gone to the regulator. And secondly, they're going to do a whole new trial with their lower dose regime to see whether or not that very high efficacy figure really uh, is uh, genuine. And so just talking carefully, I think that one of the challenges for all these vaccine manufacturers is they're under such huge pressure to deliver good news that uh, they sometimes don't quite get it right. And this is not the only vaccine for which there's been criticism by scientists. And so, um, I'm, not, uh, I'm not going to say any more now than I really encourage vaccine developers not to present their results through press releases that are not a normal way to express results of scientific studies, but actually to wait and put their data through the regulators in the normal way. Uh, Chris, do you want to come back to me? Thank you. My understanding is they have had regular dialogue with the regulators, so there is an issue. But, and for me as a comm specialist, I mean, if you do put it in a press release, get it right. I mean, there's, there's the issue of the medicine, whether, you know, the, this inadvertent error, manufacturing errors, the Daily Telegraph calls it. But if you are going to, to, to compete with others, make sure your press releases stand up to, 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 to snuff, but they, I mean, they clearly haven't. and they. And they're in a clearly a very difficult position now. Yeah. I mean, not just the share price is not a concern, but this was a lower price vaccine. They yeah. were clearly be more uh, uh, focused on getting it around the world. So a, a lot of hopes have been resting on this particular vaccine. Well, I, um, I couldn't agree more. Like others, I got really excited and still am, by the way, really excited about this vaccine in that it can be kept at four degrees centigrade in, in a normal fridge. It's awfully, uh, uh, awfully, sorry, it's a lot cheaper than some of the other vaccines. And there are many plants around the world that can manufacture it. And I, I, I don't fuss too much. 75% efficacy is very good. A lot of flu vaccines that we commonly use have an efficacy of 75% or less. And the original um, idea for a COVID vaccine was simply to look for one that was more than 50% effective. So altogether, um, I think that there's been some, some difficulties, as you say, with the press release and the decision whether or not to make that press release. I'm going to invite Annie Feltham, Loy Rago, and Chris Shipton, if we can get it organised, to make some comments. Annie, hello to you. Uh, I've been watching you a little bit uh, at the corner of my eye because this is a COVID world discussion. I know you like the COVID world discussion. So any reflections on what you've heard so far? And then you're to your point. Yeah, I, I was excited about jabs too. But it just shows that for general public, if you get the comms wrong or you seem to have done something which wasn't customary practice, um, 
rolling back to that, to getting everybody to calm down and wait for the jabs to appear, just mm. makes the situation much more difficult. Mm. Um, I want, if, I, if I could have a minute, I just wanted to go back to decentralization and what John and you have been talking about doing things locally yeah. um, and with schools. I mean, it's extremely complicated because some of my friends who are teachers are really nervous. Yeah. Um, and they're not sufficiently supported. So I think my question is, how, how do we do that better? Yeah. Um, because, you know, they, their vocabulary gets, you know, why doesn't anybody care about us would be a polite way of putting it, really. Um, and then it, it still comes back to this systems approach that we've been talking about for months um, and how locally, and I was really interested to hear what John was saying about the city, um, and we've been talking about what we've been doing here in Colchester. You can do so much locally, but then you get you might get trapped by what the, the county level does, or you get trapped by what national level is doing. And our current um, plans for when the lockdown ends on the 2nd of December, the new tier system has been rolled out by a government and central government, and they've said there's been no negotiation locally. <clears throat> So this continuation of this toing and froing between the centre um, and what's happening on the ground um, <clears throat> continues, um, and um, it makes things like just not tr but tracing, but also helping people to isolate and all the other things that we're talking about yeah. um, much more difficult. So thanks for that opportunity, and hello everybody. So oh, I want to just say to Annie, um, there's. And, and I get John to focus on this, this notion that if you're going for local or localizing, um, you are super dependent on the political context locally. And there are circumstances under which that can become quite constrictive. In my own experience of working in decentralized administrations, sometimes you yearn for central interference when you're stuck because of particular positioning locally. So I, I understand that. Your second point, uh, or your earlier point about teachers feeling unsupported seems to be an issue in many, many countries. And uh, I, I haven't got an answer. But if, if anybody on today's briefing would like to comment on what Annie has just said, please do so. Um, and I thought I'd go to Iman Ahmed Iman's been looking at some of the issues uh, and talking about, about kids' experience, but I'm not sure we'd be able to directly address Annie's point about teachers not being supported. Does anybody else just unmute if you want to speak? Okay. Let's yeah. it. Chris. Hi. Yeah, come in. Hi, David and everyone. This is Iman, yeah. yeah. So what, what's the exact question? I didn't get it, I'm sorry. Um, you've got certain stories that you're talking uh, that you wrote about about the different challenges faced by children which I think are really important and linked with what Zara was saying but I just wondered if you or anybody else had any uh, anything to add to what Anya said about teachers feeling that they are not supported well, we have lots of grievances. I can speak for uh, Ontario because I'm, I'm hearing a lot of uh, teachers complaining and sometimes even publicly protesting, writing letters to the Ontario government. Uh, they're now saying, because the government has, in the beginning they said, okay, no school closures and no reduction in, in class size. And that was uh, a major issue for teachers. No improvements in the quality of ventilation in, in classes and so on. And now they're coming back and after around 950 cases in schools, I believe, yeah. now they're um, changing the uh, decisions and ordering some schools or advising them to close. Temporarily. So the teachers are saying this is coming too little, too late. Yeah. And I think this is not isolated from generally the sense of uh, uh, about the response in Ontario. Everything is, is happening, falling short and happening too little, too late. But definitely and around Canada, actually, 
lots of uh, issues for school teachers around uh, these themes. Thank you. And I, I just want to, Iman, just say that looking, for example, in Europe, uh, comparing what we are seeing happening in Germany and what's happening in uh, uh, countries that border on Germany, again, there's that sense that there's a, a lot of learning while doing in regard to schools. And uh, a part of that is because of the early sense that children do not actually play much of a role in the transmission of the virus. And that's now thought not to be the case and that uh, particularly adolescent children can be passing on the virus. So it's that sort of quite large shift that happened in July was very, very important in leading to a swing in policy, but implementation of that policy has been super difficult. Um, we got some comments on the local versus national. I'm, I'm, because of time, I'm just going to mention them. Marianne has just made this, I and mean, I'm so glad you did it, Marianne. She says, uh, when, when I was talking about you know, sometimes when you're acting locally, you yearn for national intervention if you get stuck in a trap. And Marianne has said, but the opposite is equally bad. Living in an area like mine, we have been behaving locally, but we've been penalized nationally. And uh, no, no surprise there. Thank you very much indeed. Comment from William says, good point on vaccine development, stock market pressure, political pressure to show success. It's uh, all uh, coming together and uh, this does create uh, an almost impossible pressure on um, the uh, vaccine companies to come out with good news quickly. Loy Rago wants to just send a, give us a little bit of experience on Eid in Egypt and Egypt and Dashara Diwali in India. Loy. Yeah, hi. Uh, hi. I wanted to share this experience. Now, in Egypt, we've had three major Eids. So one is, of course, Ramadan, and that was the early days of COVID. So there was a significant, almost lockdown. I mean, there were no public places open, and even celebrations at home were small, downsized, etc. Yeah. We've had the Prophet Muhammad's birthday and a five days of vacation uh, about two weeks back, one week back. And uh, it's been much more open. Yeah. Now, I'm not saying this is, uh, this is right, mm -hmm. but, uh, and I don't have enough independent information on how effective it's been. Yeah. But certainly, the earlier period of lockdown uh, for, uh, for Eid for the whole month-long Eid, is yeah. an important lesson for Christmas. In the context of India, there have been a number of festivals. So I'll focus only on the Dashara and Diwali. And I think in many states of the country, there has been some amount of restriction and uh, uh, public celebration. In the sense, I, I'll take one example of Gan Ganpati, which is the immersion of the Elephant God, uh, an, an independent festival, but yeah. it's on a much smaller scale than it has been in the past. Yeah. So I'm not saying perfectly that we've done it right, but at the same time, there has been scaling down. Yeah. And I think as we advance in this discussion on Christmas, we've already done something quite wrong in respect of Thanksgiving, mm. but with respect to Christmas, which is a much bigger scale celebration, we will need to draw lessons from the two experiences which I talked about in two different religions. Thanks. Well, I think, Loy, that is absolutely fabulous and a really, really good note to, uh, to leave this discussion we've had on festivals. Uh, Thanksgiving is a bit peculiar. Uh, actually, I have to say that I, I had uh, real discomfort about the Thanksgiving story just because of this peculiar position of the two leaders in the US, but I, I think that we have a chance to be quite thoughtful about Christmas, and we've got time. Lloyd? 
I, I'll just add on also that I used to live in Myanmar and Thailand, and both are Buddhist countries. Yeah. And in particular, from Myanmar, I have got feedback that the scale of certain Buddhist festivals, which was much more public and open, has been scaled down. So I three different religions, three different examples, but <laughs> scaling down celebration is important, if yeah. not shutting it down altogether. So we have to find a way to say, yes, celebrate, but just find a way to celebrate in a slightly more modest way this year. Exactly. And, you know, it, it, I think if we get rollout of some of the vaccines, one thing that will change is the likelihood of severe illness and death among older people can be reduced if the vaccines work and are offered first to people who are most vulnerable, whether it is older people or health workers or whatever. Uh, we'll see how that goes. Chris Shipton, please, uh, if you wouldn't mind uh, just showing us and then also giving us any thoughts and making a comment, then I'll go to we, and then we probably will, we will close. But Chris, you've done another beautiful picture. <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, um, I just thought I would try and capture that, uh, that thing about you know the local response in a bit more of a sensible way because you know that's very interesting and I think you know um, my observation was about the conversation about governments versus uh, experts in in Kenya and uh, the reverse is true in the UK that whole kind of paradigm has been completely debased in this country so we, we don't trust experts anymore and uh, I think that it's all about narratives isn't it and I just thought you know that story about local you know action is actually quite a positive narrative in amongst all this sort of bad news and everything um also well, i had two observations that i wanted to share with you like one thing is i did a nato conference which was extremely interesting yeah. um and they did actually have like a polish nato general talking about how they dealt with covid and they did it in a very sensible way yeah. um but the NATO generals and uh, sort of appear in their sort of military uniform on their Zoom calls, and their protocol is to appear on camera wearing a NATO branded mask, and then they very formally take it off and then start speaking. Okay. So they have a very kind of uh, military and professional approach to mask wearing, okay. even on a Zoom call. And I thought that was quite interesting. Uh, the other thing is that I've been doing a lot of business events recently, and I know everyone here is a public health expert, but obviously I'm, I'm worried about the money side of things. And the, the narrative I'm picking up from the business people on calls, and, you know, I don't normally get to talk on them either, so this is great. I get to actually say something. Mm. Um, they're, they're, for some reason, this narrative is, is popping into shape that in March everyone's going to be vaccinated and this will all be over and people are making business decisions on it and people are talking about it and uh, last time you poured a giant bucket of cold water on that um maybe not today but i would love to hear some more detail on whether that is or isn't going to happen <laughs> well I, it would be a miracle if everybody in the world would be vaccinated by march 22 be a total miracle i just want to say that you know there will be some vaccination no doubt uh, early next year but we're, we're talking about a long long job to get the level of vaccine coverage even in 330 million population usa it's going to take quite a long time to get 70 percent of the adult and adolescent population immunized so thank you very much. Let's uh, just to, uh, if I could give a loud clap to Chris, it would be now. Thank you for sharing the NATO best practice. Let's hold that on board. Uh, I think Chris Shepton, uh, um, um, uh, sorry, I think others commented in the chat, but I couldn't see who commented. So that's absolutely great. Wow. My, uh, right, very, very good. Miles, thank you. Um, thank you, everybody. Uh, let's go to Tweet, please. Thank you very much. Uh, sharing results now. Uh, we have people a little bit spread, but mainly from Europe. 
and uh, one person from East Asia Pacific. I believe that's you, Haruko. Uh, good age range, and we know one of our, our young um, champions is here, Zara, you're online. And then on how we're feeling today, again, optimism always comes up um, as the greatest, but quite a few people there in the more negative emotions. So just to say thank you for your honesty. Thank you for joining. Keep connecting with us. We have the LinkedIn community chat going. Um, and, and we always hope that these sessions help give you some clarity so you can navigate this, yeah. this complex situation uh, with us all together. Thank you. Well, thank you, Twee. When we were, thank you for that metaphor. When we were talking about the, the briefing in our preparatory session this morning, um, I said it's like driving through fog with your headlights on and you still can't always see where the road is. What's your metaphor? Because you talked about navigating just there and, and I hope that these conversations help people to navigate. What's your metaphor for finding a way through all this stuff? Well, I like to think of our own community here as um, like a bus and we're all in it together. And yeah, it is very foggy out there and we're trying to, to point out the parts on that map together and we all appreciate that the roads will change and, uh, and we may all take different paths, but uh, we'll figure it out together. And at some point we'll have to adapt um, when new things come up. Yeah. There you go. It is at some point we will have to adapt. We won't all adapt at the same time and it will come differently. John, give us a sign off, please. Well, that caught, caught me on the hop. Well, it, it just take, it takes a bit of time. For me, it's like walking up a mountain and you've got the mist around you. And every so often you see these little bits of the valley below and slowly you put together the picture. And it feels like in these conversations, we're slowly getting little bits more and more and more of the picture until it starts to make sense for everybody where we are. So there we go. Everybody, thank you for joining. We do hope that these conversations help finding your way through it. We're always pleased to receive messages from you. Haruko, when you join from Tokyo, we are happy. It's lovely. Aileen Kennedy, thank you for being with us. Add spikers. It's been, been great, the connections we've been able to have. Sarah Phillips, it's lovely to see you again. Thank you for being with us. And please stay connected. It's your, your presence is very, very reassuring. And you also your honesty in telling us that things sometimes up, sometimes down, and your own business is struggling a bit. So thank you for talking about that before. Chris Langton, thank you for bringing in your work as a leadership man and a communicator, Louis Zanofke, lovely to see you. If that's your real background, you look to be in a pretty nice place. Uh, uh, I think it might be fake, I don't know, but it's nice. Miles, thank you for coming. And Zara, both of you being here. You might be in different rooms in where you live. I'm trying to work it out, but it's nice that you're both here. Georgina, thank you for joining. And as always, it's lovely. I don't know where you are, but you could be somewhere on the ocean. We never know with you. Nice that you're here. Iman, thank you again. Joe, thank you as always. And then Holly, I know that on Friday mornings you're in the car driving and doing stuff, but it's nice that you were able to be with us today. And Krishna, thank you. Thank you very much indeed for... Uh, joining and your comments. And Maurizio, lovely that you're here. Patrick, always good to see you. Claudia, great that you're here as well. And then there are a couple of other people who I don't know who you are, so please forgive me not being able to give you your name.